is an ABT color presentation. This is a brand new foal, a baby horse that was born just a few days ago. In a year or two, when it grows up, it's going to become a very special kind of horse, a trotter. Today, Discovery will find out more about how this unusual breed is raised and trained as we take a close look at the Great American Harness Horse. Discovery 69, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Lowen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, welcome to Discovery. Today we're visiting a most unusual farm, a horse farm in Florida, where some of this country's most valuable and beautiful horses are being raised. They're called American Standard Bred Harness Racers. A horse farm is a fascinating place to visit any day of the year, but one of the most exciting times is in the early spring, during foaling season. A baby horse is called a foal, and this one was born just one week ago. This foal is a male, so it's known as a colt. If it were a female, it would be called a filly. A newborn foal is usually able to get up and start walking around almost immediately. When a colt is four years old, he becomes a stallion. And when a filly reaches four, she's known as a mare. And if she produces especially good offspring and is bred every year, she's then called a brood mare. The stallion that's used for breeding is known as a sire. purebred horses have their official birthday on the same day, January 1st of each year. Although most foals are born during February, March, and April, on January 1st of the next year, they will all be considered one year old. Then after their first birthday, both colts and fillies are called yearlings. These yearlings can stay outdoors day and night, and they're fed outdoors twice a day. The stallions and some of the mares who are about to have foals are fed inside their barns. A separate mixture is prepared for each horse, made up of oats, protein pellets, corn, wheat bran, a pinch of salt, and an ounce of liquid vitamins. Warm water is added and it's all mixed together into a mash in an individual feeding tub for each horse. are fed outdoors, right in their pasture. They've all learned to recognize the feed truck, and as soon as it comes through the gate, the mares gather around and follow the truck through the field. Along with bundles of hay, the men drop off a bunch of large pellets called range cubes. These cubes are actually horse-sized vitamin pills. This particular horse farm that we're visiting is called Castleton Farm, and it's in the northern part of Florida. Right now, there are over 300 horses here. They've raised and bred some of the champion harness horses of our country. 
Because these horses are so valuable for racing as well as for breeding, they all receive the very best of care. Some of the youngsters whose parents live and work on the farm get a chance to learn all about raising and handling these horses at an early age. By the time they're in their teens, most of them are able to take care of the detailed work of caring for the horses. The people who do this work are called grooms. Every day, each one of these horses gets a careful grooming. This is important not only to make him look better, but also to make him feel better. It keeps his coat clean, free of dirt, and healthy. To complete the job, each horse gets a hairdressing. His mane and tail are combed out. With this kind of care, you can see why these horses are able to continue to lead healthy lives, producing fine offspring even when they're 15 or 20 years old, long after they've stopped racing. Breeding records that go back many generations are kept for each horse. And when people speak of a horse having a fine bloodline, they mean that it has come from championship parents. If you want one with a pedigree, a great pedigree on this coat, and a great size coat, well developed, everything about him is just perfect. All right, who'll give five time to start? At large horse auctions, the auctioneer will give as much information as possible about the horse's ancestors so that people will know what kind of bloodline it has. A horse with a fine heritage can bring a very high price. Hey, Charlie, would he give you 95 for a dollar with it? I'll be dying. You might as well buy a good one if you're going to buy one, boy. I'll be dying. I'm going to go 95 for a dollar. What makes these horses so valuable? And why is so much attention paid to their breeding? It's because of their inherited ability to do something that no other kind of horse can do as well. We'll find out what it is in just a minute. Back in the 1800s, in the days before the automobile, a good harness horse was something that every family needed. It was used for working, to pull a plow or a wagon, and for transportation when it was hitched to the family buggy. If you had to get somewhere in a hurry, you might have ridden a saddle horse. But the galloping movement of a high-speed saddle horse would be uncomfortable and jerky if it were hitched to a buggy. So for a smoother movement, harness horses were used because of their ability to trot, a controlled movement that provides a steady pull for long periods of time. There are actually two different types of horses that were developed here in America for the same purpose. One is called a trotter, and the other is a pacer. You can see the difference by watching them move in slow motion. The trotter moves in what's known as a diagonal step. He moves his right front and left rear legs at the same time. Then the opposite, the left front and right rear legs. The trotter also makes a high step with his front legs. The pacer makes a lateral step using his right front and right rear legs at the same time, then his left front and left rear legs. The pacer usually wears more equipment than the trotter, like the leather loops around its legs called hobbles. The hobbles help to keep the horse moving its legs on the same side at the same time. Whenever you see a horse wearing hobbles, you can be sure it's a pacer. 
harness racing itself goes way back in history. The ancient Egyptians, the Greeks and the Romans held chariot races with their horses. Chariot racing was an Olympic event as early as 1000 BC. In Europe, racing with coaches and wagons was a popular sport in the 1700s. But it was in America in the 1800s that the plain man sport of racing trotters and pacers really developed. You may hear people speak of thoroughbred racing as the sport of kings, but harness racing was really the plain man sport. It started when people began using the working harness horse as a form of recreation. If you had a fast trotter that you were especially proud of, you'd want to show him off. And you'd probably challenge your neighbor to a race. The idea of challenge races spread across the country. People discovered that it was even faster and more fun to race their horses with a two-wheeled cart called a sulky instead of a four-wheeled buggy. As the sport became more popular, the selective breeding of the horses themselves developed into a fine art in our country. To distinguish the breed from thoroughbred or saddle racers, they became known as the American Standard Horse because originally they had to be able to pace or trot one mile in the standard time of two minutes and 20 seconds or better. Nowadays, a horse is qualified as a standard bred according to his breeding, the same as a thoroughbred. Many of the early famous harness racers came from thoroughbred stock. And probably the most famous of all was the great Dan Patch, who was born in 1896. This remarkable old film showing Dan Patch and his owner, M.W. Savage, was made over 60 years ago. No horse in the history of harness racing has ever equaled Dan Patch's record. He won every single race he was ever entered in. He raced the mile in less than two minutes, 30 times. In the past 60 years of racing, Dan Patch's fastest time for the mile, one minute, 55 and a quarter seconds, has been bettered by only a few seconds. His owner was so devoted to Dan Patch that when the great horse died on July 11, 1916, Mr. Savage passed away the very next day. In the early 1900s, a great change began to take place as the harness horse was replaced by the automobile and the tractor. But the tradition of racing these horses was kept alive at county fairs and small racing tracks all over the country. If not for the growing popularity of racing these horses, this breed might have died out and disappeared. But the sport grew and developed. There have been tremendous advances in the methods of breeding, training, and caring for these horses. We'll find out how a trainer breaks in a young horse, and we'll see how trotters are prepared for a major race. We'll do that in just a minute. How does a young, standard-bred horse learn to become a championship racer? It requires knowledge and skill on the part of the trainer to improve the horse's own natural abilities. Unlike thoroughbreds, in harness racing, the trainer frequently does his own driving. Delvin Miller has been raising, training, and driving championship horses for over 39 years. He's about to show us some of the most important steps in breaking a young filly. Now this is the first phase of line driving. This filly's had the bit on her in the stall for a few days. She's had the harness on her. She knows what a bit is now. We're just starting now to line drive her for the first time in her life. Now this filly is an exceptionally well-mannered filly. And we'll probably do this with her for maybe six or eight days and then hook her to the cart and go on from there. Now I'll start going around in a circle with her just to teach her what the right side of the bit is. Then after I do that a while, then I'll turn around and go to the left a few times. This is just to get her mouth used to the bit and to the gentle pull of the lines or the reins on each side of her mouth. 
Now, a horse has a very tender mouth, so we don't jerk him or yank him or anything. We do everything gently and very smooth. Now, this filly is doing along very well, and I think for her first day, she's doing a real good job. Now, we've seen this filly line driven, and this is the first time she's ever been hitched to a cart, a training cart. We start driving here in the middle of the racetrack. We do this so there is a little margin for error. She can go in and out, but we'll still be on the racetrack. We hate to get them too close to the fence because they may shy and go over it and hurt themselves. Now, I have a whip in my hand, but I don't use this to punish her or anything. I just use this to attract her attention. I just touch her with that whip. And she really knows then that I'm behind her, and she kind of pays attention to me because she knew I was behind her when I was driving her during the line driving process. Now, when we come to places on the racetrack, she might shy off like she just did then. And sometimes they'll go out and shy away and get close to a fence. Well, I don't like to pull her heads away from the fence. We try to pull her heads to the fence like I did then and let them see it so they won't take a chance in going over. I think this filly's doing an exceptionally good job of being hooked the first time. She's uh, alert, she pays attention to me, and I think she's a very nice pupil for her first time around the racetrack. Now, this is another phase in breaking a filly for eventual racing, is getting behind the gate. Now, this is the first time that this filly's ever been behind the starting gate. We come out here in the mornings and drive around slowly behind it. She's a little afraid of it, a little suspicious of it. But as I let her go along and look at it, she'll gradually go right up and put her nose on the gate. Now, we like to have them touch it because sometime in the actual start of a race, they have to touch this gate. And since they've done it before, it won't make them afraid of it. So you see, she's gone up to the gate now. She's touched it. She's gone up about alert and as nice as anyone I've ever taken up to the gate. By the time a colt or filly has reached two years of age, it's usually ready to begin actual racing. But the daily training and workouts continue all through its racing career. During the season, there'll be morning trials on the training track six days a week and the trainers will continue to look for ways to improve their horses' abilities. this care and attention makes a big difference when it comes to the night of an actual race. In the paddock, there are stalls to accommodate over a hundred horses for all ten races. Each of the horses will go out for a practice trial three times before its actual race at one hour intervals. One minute. One minute for your third race. The horses are harnessed up with all the gear they'll use during the race. Unlike thoroughbred racing jockeys, the weight and age of a sulky driver are not crucial factors. There are drivers of all different sizes and ages. To begin the actual race, the starting gate is driven up ahead of the horses. The official starter guides the drivers into position and then, they're off.
This is the night that counts. The selective breeding, the years of careful handling and grooming, and the work and skill of the trainers all lead up to this, the night of the race. For it's here that each individual horse must succeed. We'll be back in just a minute. As we've seen today, there's a close relationship between these harness horses and their trainers. It's this partnership between a skilled man and a spirited animal that creates a champion of the breed, the American harness horse. If you'd like to find out more about harness horses, then ask your librarian for any of these books. Meet the Horse by Patricia H. Johnson, All About Horses by Marguerite Henry, and this book, Horse Form by Pat Johnson. Be sure to join us next week for another exciting discovery program. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.